Hello, everybody. I'm Brian Levine. Welcome to the Gould Standard, a podcast brought to you by the Glenn Gould Foundation. We bring you conversations with remarkable people from all across the world of the arts. If music, theater, sculpture, painting, film, poetry, novels, or multimedia art are your personal bridge over troubled waters, come on in, dry your feet, and set a spell with us. Now, while you're stopping in, please do take a moment to press like, share, and subscribe. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please kindly leave your reviews, post your questions, and be part of our community of friends and supporters. And to get more wonderful words, images, and sounds, you can pay a visit to our website, www.glengould.ca. And when you're there, you will not fail to notice the Donate button. We are a registered Canadian charity, and your support means the world to us. Please give generously. Today, I feel like I'm in for a personal treat because our guest is someone that I absolutely love, both as an artist and as a person. She's a singer with a heart as big as the great state of Illinois, where she originally hails from, and she's one of those performers whose combination of vocal brilliance, acting, and passion never fails to make the hairs on the back of one's neck tingle. She can uh, deliver a roundhouse sock to the tear ducts just about every time. Yes, folks, today we're going to take a plunge into the world of opera. But for those of you who have never been to an opera, and even if you can't imagine going, don't run and hide under the bed. Stick around, because by the time we're done, I think you just might be convinced to give it a try and find out why so many people all around the world are in love with this amazing art form. Yes, our guest is the amazing Sandra Radvanovsky, and she's going to help us to understand why, at its heart, opera is simply the art of telling stories through the power of music and letting the music bring out the emotions that words alone cannot express. She is one of the great singing actresses of our time. She's hailed around the world for bringing the great Verdi heroines to life, and more recently, one of the finest bel canto singers anywhere. Again, we're going to explain what all of that means, so bear with us. Sandra, it's so good to have you here. Welcome, welcome. Greetings from Paris, France. Yes, you're in Paris. It's amazing. I know the, the whole world has been thrown for a loop by COVID and the performing arts first and foremost among them. It's remarkable how you've responded. We're going to talk about some of the, the special things that you've been doing during this time. But in the meantime, how do you find yourself in Paris today? We just did a production, a new production of Aida here at the Bastille. It was because of the COVID quarantine regulations and all the regulations around the world right now, unfortunately without a live audience, but we did a live capture and it was live oh, on television here. And actually I heard over in North America. So we just finished that. And I am waiting now to go to Malta to record a Verdi Requiem. Oh, amazing, amazing. Who's going to be conducting the Requiem? Marco Armigliato, an Italian. Joseph Kaleha is the tenor. And oh, Christian wow. Van Horn is our bass baritone. Every time those bass drums smack in the DS areas, I, I wonder oh. that everyone doesn't jump up and down on stage. It's, it's really I do, inside. Blood-curdling. Yeah. yeah. It's, yes. <laughs> I always call the Verdi Requiem the best opera that Verdi wrote. It's amazing. Yeah, and of course you get to stand in one place, so it's not quite so stressful. Yes, exactly. You don't have to worry about the high sea and Opatria oh, Mia and Aid either. So. <laughs> yeah, and you get to choose your own costume. Yes, so true. So true. Yeah. Because of all the quarantine regulations, I couldn't fly back home to Canada when I was done with Aida and then come back to Europe and make it in time out of quarantine. So I just am staying here in Paris. I guess if you had to be stranded anywhere, you could do worse. Yeah, but it's not the Paris that you know and love. Yeah. Everything is different right now. The, everything's closed. All the restaurants are closed. I'm sitting in my dressing room because I have no internet in my apartment. Oh, no. My God. Horror of horrors. You have to read books when you're at home. Oh, you know what? I love it. Forced unplugging. That's great. 
We could all use a bit of that. I, I do have to say as well that our paths first crossed when you were a juror for the 12th Glenn Gould Prize. Yes. And were part of the the panel that that chose as our laureate one of the great American sopranos of all time, one of the great sopranos of all time, yes. Jesse Norman. Yes. And were part of the celebration with two amazing performances, two great Verdi performances. We were so thrilled. And I think that must have been a special moment for everyone who loves opera. And, and it was special for her, too. It was her last public appearance. Yeah, I know. Who knew that that was going to be the last time we saw her in person? What an amazing woman, amazing artist, amazing human being. And she had so much to say in the operatic world and was really groundbreaking in so many ways. So I was very happy that we decided upon her as the winner. I should also say for our, our listeners that since that time, Sandra honored the Glenn Gould Foundation by joining our board of directors, which means actually that you're my boss. The hushed, the hushed and reverential tones in which I'll be posing my questions from this point on. No, I don't think of it that way. We are equals and we all have one goal in mind, and, and that is to spread the word of music globally. That's true. And, and as you probably know, hushed and reverential just ain't my style. Nor mine. No, indeed. I'd like to start off by going right back to the beginning. You grew up on the outskirts of Chicago, right? Correct. A great opera city. That was actually what? Berwyn, right? Berwyn, Berwyn Illinois? Berwyn, Illinois. Just right outside of downtown Chicago, yeah. And when you were still a child, your family moved to Richmond, Indiana. I guess that means that you are a dyed-in-the-wool Midwesterner. Yes, yes. Brought up as a Midwesterner, but I relate more as a Canadian these days. We, we are, as Canadians, very delighted that you are one of us now. But I do want to ask a little bit about your early experiences. You sure. went to uh, Richmond High. Go Devils. You did your research. Richmond High, I, I, I was doing some research, and Richmond High was a remarkable school. Uh, looks like it was a real community center. It's got a performing arts center, a museum, and a lot of notable alumni, including George Dunning, who wrote over 300 film scores, the actor and director, Norman Lloyd, Wilbur Wright went to your school, a Nobel Prize winning chemist, and actually on the bizarre side, the cult leader, Jim Jones, was one of your alums, too. I know. Richmond, Indiana used to be a very happening town. And then, I don't know. I don't know what happened to it. All, all the industry started to leave. Yeah. One of the great centers of jazz. Actually, yeah. one of the great centers of jazz for the world, because it was the home city of Jeanette Records, which gave the world the first recordings of Louis Armstrong and Jelly Roll Morton, King Oliver, and Hoagie Carmichael. Yeah. So. You grew up in a cultural mecca, even though a little one. I did. What kind of music were you listening to when you grow, grew up? It's funny. I started taking voice lessons at 11 years old in Richmond, Indiana, mostly because of my church choir directors and the Ebies were their names. And I was in all the church choirs, very young age. And they pulled my mom aside and they said, she's been given a gift and you really need to nurture it. And I think that she's ready to start taking voice lessons. And at 11 years old, what does a kid listen to? But I had church music always playing in my ear and my mother and father really loved both jazz. My father was a huge jazz lover and my mom loved classical music. So I, all my life listened to and sang classical music or the classical Broadway albums as well. Carousel mm -hmm. and The King and I and Kismet and all of that. That was always playing in our household. So that was what I really grew up listening to. And it sounds really cheesy, but opera and classical music is what I grew up listening to. And it's what's in me. It's what I'm made of. That's, that's fantastic. When did you first attempt an operatic aria? Was it soon after you started studying? 
Yeah, I would say I started out with what we call in the opera business, the 24 greatest hits. And that's the Italian anthology of art songs. And there's different versions of it, but there are 24 Italian songs that all young singers learn. And so I started with those. And then probably around 13 years old, my voice teacher said, I'm going to give you this aria. And it was Carabino, which is from The Marriage of Figaro, which is also a mezzo-soprano role, not a soprano role, which is what I am now. So mezzo-soprano, for those of you not familiar with the terminology, is literally means half soprano or a lower soprano. So it was a lower voice. And I started out in the lower voice and then worked my way up. So Voi Che Sapete was my first aria. And uh, of course, Carabino is what they call a trousers role. In other words, you're singing the part of a young boy. So that obviously gave you a chance to work on your acting skills. I didn't get that far. I just worked on it vocally. <laughs> 13 years old, I, I wasn't really thinking yeah. too much about acting. I was just like, oh, are all these notes, are they all going in the right place? And yeah, it was a great experience. And did you almost immediately begin to think this could be the way I spend my life? This could be a career? Yes, absolutely. So from the very beginning, I, I did my first opera when I was 13 years old. What opera was that? Carmen. I was a smoke girl in Carmen. What does a little were... third? <laughs> I know. Who allows a 13-year-old to be a smoke girl? But my mom was at every rehearsal. And then I did Hansel and Gretel that same season. I was like, when at night I go to sleep, 14 angels watch over me. It was, yeah, 13 years old. Amazing. I understand your first starring role was uh, Mimi in Bohème. Well, everything, don't you, Brian? <laughs> yes. At 21 yeah. years old in Richmond, Indiana, of all places, after I had moved away, it was for me an, op an opportunity to come back and to sing my first leading role at 21 years old. Wow. Was that a stage production? It was a fully staged production. Yeah. Wow. That must have been an incredible experience. So basically, you got to experience unbridled love and dying of consumption. Yes. And a horrible wig. <laughs> a very <laughs> horrible wig. Oh, man. But yes, it was with orchestra, fully staged costumes, everything. It was the full shebang. And I was so fortunate. And they gave me no preferential treatment. I had to audition in New York City, the same as everyone else. And I was living in California at that point. And I had to fly to New York City and sing with hundreds and hundreds of other people. And they gave me the role still. So. Well, that's great. That's great. You did your advanced vocal studies in California, right? Correct. Yes. I went to, uh, I, I did a young artist program at Opera Pacific. And then I went to University of Southern California. And then I left there and I went to UCLA and studied acting. And then I left there and I went to Chapman College. And then I decided, you know what? College really isn't for me. And <laughs> it's not for everybody. The academic right. world is you either love it and embrace it or you figure out how you learn best. And musicians in particular, some learn better just by hands-on experience. So I have no degree. You have no degree. but. You've done enough auditions to have had the third degree every so often. <laughs> Perfect way to put and, it, yes. Uh, yeah. But along the way, did you find that one special teacher? I mean, many singers talk about the moment when they found the person who really understood them and their potential and helped them to master the technique and find in their voice what their voice was capable of. Was, did you have an experience like that? I've been very fortunate. Uh, to have great teachers, not just teachers, but mentors. And they taught me not just about my voice, but about the whole singing business and about becoming a complete package because there's so much more to being an opera singer than just the singing. And at a certain level, the singing part should be automatic. 
And my first big teacher like that, his name was Marcel Sanger, a French lyric baritone. And I met him at the Music Academy of the West in Santa Barbara, California. And he was the very first gentleman that said to me, first person that said to me, I have good news and I have bad news. He said to me, the great news is that you're going to be a professional singer. And I said, wow, okay, so what's the bad news? And he said, you have no idea how difficult your journey is going to be. And I appreciate that he told me the truth because the statistically singers graduating from college, from university, it's maybe about a 15% success rate. That's not a lot. And no. that, that go on to have a full lifelong career. And one day I showed up, up because I was living in Southern California at that point down in Laguna Beach. And it was about a three hour drive for me to go to my voice lessons twice a week. And one wow. day, yeah, I know. And one day, yeah. one way drive. And one day I showed up and I wasn't quite prepared. And he said to me, I'm going to teach you a lesson today, Sandra. And I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> and he said, you're going to go home. You're not going to waste my time. And he said, and you're going to learn from this. And I'm telling you, best learning experience of my whole career was him teaching me, always be prepared. That kind of tough love is important sometimes. I, I think so. And I've been very fortunate to have people not sugarcoat it for me in my career and in my life. They've been very honest and open. And I appreciate that. And I hope I pass it forward the same way. The other person in my life, there was another vocally, the, the person that I think has influenced me the most. And she just recently passed away in October of last year was Ruth Falcon, a voice teacher, very famous singer herself. And she really gave me the technique. She taught me everything that she knew and she understood dramatic voices and how dramatic voices grow and learn. And that being different than a lighter voice per se, like a color to a high voice soprano or a lighter voice of Mozart singers, as opposed to a Verdi or a Puccini or a Wagnerian singer. And she really taught me how to grow into my voice and my technique as I grew as a person as well. And I actually want to get into that in a little bit, the life cycle of a voice and, and how at certain times in your life and career, it's not quite the right time yet for certain roles and others are, and there's a kind of a, almost a training that you go through in the choice of roles. Hi folks, this is Olivia. I am a producer here at The Gould Standard, and I wanted to let you know that at this point in our interview, we had some technical difficulties that made it necessary for us to record the remainder of the episode using Zoom. So moving forward, you will see a quality difference in the audio, but I'm sure you'll agree the conversation with Sandra more than makes up for that little setback. Sandra being the shining star that she is. So we thank you for your patience and your understanding. And without further ado, let's get back to the gold standard. When people think about the training and education of an opera singer, I think a lot of people have the, the idea that it's just learning to sing the notes from high to low and developing the, the vocal resilience to keep in there on stage for a whole evening, but there's a whole lot more to it than that. First of all, there's languages, and you obviously had to master a language or two along the way. How, how did that go? Horribly at, at the beginning, honestly. <laughs> a nice Midwest girl with a Czech father and a Danish mother, both of whom said to me at a very early age, you are American and you will speak English. So yeah, it was very difficult. I couldn't wrap my mouth literally around a foreign language. I heard a lot of Czech growing up because my father was fluent in Czech, but Italian was my chosen language. And it was the one that I really related to the most. 
And and it turns out that is the language that I sing the most in. So thank God I learned the right one. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a long, it was a long journey with the languages for sure. Yeah. With your R's and getting the vowels uh, long mm. enough, flat enough. And you know, here I was a nice Midwest girl. You go to Bob's and you have that nice flat ah, and uh, <laughs> so very non-Italian, right? And you <laughs> and you lean into those R's, R, yeah, R, yeah, yeah. R, R, R. and, and yeah. very American, not just American, North American. We we have a tendency to chew all of our words a lot more than the Europeans, the Italians, the Germans, the French. So that was looking back. One thing, if I could have done differently, better was learn languages a lot sooner. Right. And along with the languages and the notes is memorization. You've got to build a very powerful memory because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you need to not only, in order to get your cues, not only know your part, but all the other parts. Yeah, it's like having a one-sided conversation. Yeah. You, you have to know what they're saying, not just uh, so it be, it's real and it looks real. Opera is just like any other kind of art form, any kind of form of conversation. You have to have be understood and understand. And those right. are two important things. And then, of course, you've already mentioned acting. You are in a play, a play with music, but it's still a play. So that has to be part of your training and experience, as well as everything that goes into a stage performance taking yeah. direction, movement, what's upstage, what's downstage, stage left, oh, stage yeah. right. And yeah. they have to look at the conductor the whole time, because if you right. don't watch the conductor, you can get lost. It so it's really, it's a game that you play. How much acting can I do while still seeing the conductor waving that little baton in the pit? Yep. And, and of course, the, uh, the never to be forgotten, watch out for that falling sandbag. <laughs> Thank God never happened to me, but yes, the pitfalls on stage, the, 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 the stage stories that you hear from so many singers, it's, it's amazing. Right. The other part, which is the one that I mentioned at first, which it isn't entirely, is the vocal training to get your voice to respond musically in a wide range of different styles, different ranges, and different roles have completely different demands for, for the singer, correct? Absolutely. And I, I was fortunate or unfortunate, however you look at it, to choose one of the most demanding composers, Verdi, who really just demanded everything from their singers, high and loud, high and soft, low, the full range of the vocal, of the voice. And Verdi really demands that of all of his singers, especially the Sopranos. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> the Sopranos are heroines. Mm -hmm. Wagner, his heroes are sometimes sopranos, but just as often as not tenors. Mostly but, tenors, yeah. Yeah, mostly tenors. And, but in Verdi, it's really the women who carry the lion's share of the load and also end up getting killed the most often. There is that, but it's fun. <laughs> it, it's fun getting killed, especially on stage. You die of different things. You die of consumption. You die of poison. You die of a stab wound. It's all, it's, it's pretend in a way. Right. And it's, it's, it's a way to live out your dreams and everything on stage. And because I'm a very happy person off stage, but on stage, I'm pretty melancholy. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> yeah, it's a, a chance to purge the, those negative feelings. Exactly. Um, now, you did the Met auditions, the Metropolitan Opera auditions when you were 26. Correct. What was that like? Was that pretty high pressure? Extremely high pressure. I, but you know what? I was too young. My voice teacher called me sophomoric at that point because I just thought I knew everything and I was going to own the world. And I had no idea, actually, the depth and the breadth of what I was partaking in and what I was actually trying to be a part of. And I just naively went in singing oh, an aria from... Aida. And <laughs> I just thought, why not? 
which is a very hard at, I had just turned 26 when I was there. So in, all during the rehearsals, I was 25. So I was one of the younger people in the competition. And yeah, and, and they still chose me as a winner. I don't know why, but they uh, saw something. Damn good, that's why? I, at that point, I was working on being damn good. I think I was, as, as my Ruth Falcon, my voice teacher called me, she called me a dit, a diva in training. <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> How's my dit? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, and you joined the uh, the Mets Lindemann Young Artist Program in 1996. But Correct. and that means that you would were actually being included in productions, usually in smaller roles to start with. But yeah. uh, I was looking at the Mets 1996 season, and that included singers like Pavarotti, Domingo. Teresa mm -hmm. Stratus, Cecilia Bartoli, Mirella Freni. That's a pretty heady company to be plunged into the middle of. Was that a, a shock wow. to your system? It was. And that was when I think all of the naivete from the auditions hit me right in the face and said, wow, you are in above your head, Sandra. And because for the longest time, I was the most talented rode on those coattails for a long time. And a lot of artists will tell you this. They were always the top of their game and the top of their class. And then there's a moment when, wow, you have to work harder to catch up with these other people. And I learned very quickly that I had to work much harder and much smarter. And so I, I went to every opera I went to every rehearsal. I talked with all of these artists, probably naively, but saying to Placido Domingo, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I was just, I just wanted to know. And, and that's how I learned. Right. I learned not only from the great singers, but from the bad singers too. Cause you learn not, you learn what not to do as well as what to emulate. Right, exactly. And also the lesson about how not to destroy your voice by yeah. using it incorrectly. But that actually does raise an interesting question, because when you're thrown out onto the stage at the Metropolitan Opera, it's not even the Royal Opera House or the Vienna Staats Opera. It is the largest opera house in the world, 3,800 seats. You have what some people have described as the best orchestra in the world. No disrespect to the, the regular symphony orchestras. You have some of the greatest conductors in the world, the greatest chorus, arguably, anywhere, and some of the most elaborate staging and set capabilities anywhere. That's right. a lot to take in. But let's talk about 3,800 seats. And if you include all the standing room and the score desk that is way at the top, all of that included, it comes up to a very round 4,200 seats. Wow. That's yeah. Amazing. Overwhelming. That's but amazing. some of the best acoustics in any opera house in the world, in my opinion. And well, that, that helps. But, but you also have to be able to launch it out to that very back of the house. And that's a pretty far distance away. So that is, I think, a bit of a trial by fire, isn't it? Uh, first of all, you are in the, the epitome of world class in terms of production. Mm -hmm. You're the cast members that you're playing opposite, even if you're not in the starring roles, the orchestra, and you still have to reach however many feet it is to that back row. It's a long way. It's yeah. a very, it's a deep opera house and also quite a wide opera house. And it is, as you said, the largest in the world, and also to a certain degree, one of the most important opera houses in the world, or at least was until the last year hit. But yes, it was the greatest training ground for me. I learned very quickly that I learned by doing and trying on stage. And I would try, I started out, I joke around that I started out as the second tree to the left and then progress to the first tree to the right <laughs> and doing small little roles. But when you're on stage, there's something magical that happens to an artist and not every artist has that happen. And you either 
completely rid yourself of all of your fears or you are completely obsessed with all of your fears with stage fright. And I learned very quickly that I became another person when I stepped onto the stage, that energy from the audience, the energy from the orchestra, from all of my colleagues on stage with me, made me into this person I used to call, or still do call, Sandy Singer. And it was, it's my alter ego, but it's a very fearless person. And she just takes charge of the moment. And I learned that very quickly. I, I learned, oh, you know what? You missed that note tonight, but maybe in the next show, you're gonna try something different. And it drove me, it fed me to try harder, to try different things. And I was given that opportunity in the three years as a young artist there to really do smaller roles, yet still were important because you're still on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera singing with the best of the best. And you either rise to the occasion or you don't. In operas of the stature of Verdi or Puccini, mm -hmm. there is no unimportant role because every note in the score is part of the music and the conception. Yeah. It's all important. Yes, and I, I did more than just Verdi and Puccini. When I was in The Young Artist, I even covered a Philip Glass opera. Oh, wow. And it taught you versatility. And I think that in my experience, the North American singers truly are the most versatile because English is their first language. And so we are forced to learn another language just as well as English to go on stage. And it forced me to work harder. I've always thought, especially for singers, that the biggest challenge with Philip Glass is not losing your place. Because if you fall one note out of step, you're lost. Thank God that there is someone in front of you called a prompter. And the Metropolitan Opera still employs a prompter. And for those of you out there that don't know who that is, this is a person that sits in a box at the very front of the stage before the orchestra pit. And they are there with the score and they are cueing everybody, telling you when to come in, when to not come in. Give, they give you your word literally two seconds before you say it. With so I, I'm going to say Philip Glass and they go Philip and I go Philip Glass. <laughs> but it's, a, it's an art and it, it is an art form that is quickly dying because not many opera houses use them now. Really? They, oh no, yeah, because many reasons. First, cost. If you don't need to, that would be the first person that's going to be cut. Also, productions nowadays are so much about the visual mm -hmm. as well as the audio. And that box gets in the way of the picture on stage. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I, I never thought of that. And, and since you, you mentioned the prompter, I, if you are in a completely different corner of the stage, then uh, that's got to be a little scary because you you lose your sightline to the prompter. You make sure that those parts that you don't know so well, you make sure that you're very close to that prompter. Right, and in exactly. Philip Glass, it is all about, for those of you who don't know Philip Glass's music, it's very repetitive and it's the repetition that makes it so special. And it's it changes the, the beat of the music a lot. It's very hypnotic in a way. And he's written some really amazing movie music as well. Mm -hmm. But that said, if counting is not your forte, don't sing Philip Glass. <laughs> right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Which, which production were you in, Satyagraha? No, I was in The Voyage. Oh, okay. Yeah, That's I was amazing. covering a woman called, her name is Patricia Schumann. And unfortunately, she went skiing and broke her leg. <laughs> Oh no! So I was the second cover, not just the first, not the first cover, but the second cover, because they had back in those days two covers. God forbid something happened in productions that were difficult like this, and she broke her leg skiing and missed a couple of weeks of rehearsal, and so I got to do rehearsals of Philip Glass's music. Oh. And I okay, I'm going to tell a little story out of school because people love this. 
my best friend at that point, Christine Gerke, also another soprano, whom a lot of you have heard at the Canadian Opera Company in the Wagnerian roles, was also singing a different role in The Voyage. And so I came to her on opening night and Philip Glass's music is repetitive. So I said to her, you did a great job. You did a great job. You did a great job. <laughs> Way to go. And at that point, her eyes just bugged out of her head and she's looking behind me. And Philip Glass was standing behind me. <laughs> oh, no. And he, but thank God he has a good sense of humor and he, he laughed. Does. He does. He does. Was he like, was oh, no. Yeah. He was our Glenn Gould Prize winner before Jesse Norman. So we had a chance to work with him. And he was not only has a great sense of humor, but he's very gracious and, and very, uh, he, he doesn't give himself a lot of airs. And actually, that's something about the world of opera. Now, I know that there is this image of divas and big egos and temper tantrums and so on, but I, I, I've i encountered it once or twice, but I think it's, it's really rare. The sense of everyone pulling together and not being pretentious and not having fits and working through the problems together it's it's uh, like a big family listen the, the term diva has a negative connotation and the term diva is actually the prima donna in the opera that's who a diva is she is the female lead she's the diva and the male lead is a devo male version of it but people don't always understand the technical difficulties that we as singers have to encounter day in and day out. It's not just singing, put that aside. We have to sometimes deal with directors whom we just don't quite understand and they don't quite understand us. No, I'm sorry. I'm not gonna sing that high C in O Patria Mia soft while doing a handstand. I, I <laughs> technically can't do it. Or you're encumbered with a dress or a costume. Oftentimes when you do Swat Angelica, you have to wear a nun's habit. You can't hear. And directors don't always think through this or a conductor wants you to do a tempo that you just cannot for the life of you do. And so they call us difficult or they call us divas. But actually we know ourselves better than anyone else. And we're called stubborn or difficult, but we know what's going to work for us and what doesn't. And I think those days of the big, huge diva fits, and I'm sure all of you have heard about the soprano or that soprano or this tenor or that tenor, those days are over. And you, as you say, we're all here, especially now after or during a pandemic, we're all here just for one purpose, and that is to make art and music. I've certainly seen that. I the way people rally together and give of each other in the the opera world is inspiring and it's beautiful. Moving on, when did you first perform outside the U.S.? It was uh, because I never take the easy route. It was in Cologne, Germany, and I was singing my very first opera. It was a role debut in Russian. Oh, I know. The very first time I had sung in Russian, it was Eugene Onegin. I was doing Tatiana. Oh, it's beautiful. And it was my world debut. It was my house debut. It was my European debut. Ooh. Speaking of learning curve, wow. I didn't speak German because German classes were at 10 o'clock in the morning at the Metropolitan Opera. <laughs> and I am not quite a morning person. And Frau Spiegelmann, our, our German teacher, she would always say to me, Sandra, someday you're going to regret not coming to my classes. <laughs> and that day came <laughs> when all the rehearsals were done in German. <sighs> yeah. Oh my gosh. And yeah. of course you had to sing in perfectly enunciated Russian, yes. which is a whole different set of sounds. Yes. And okay. A set of sounds that I grew up hearing because I heard Czech, my father and, and our family spoke Czech. So I, I was very good at wrapping my mouth around the Russian and the Czech language. 
but getting it's, it's, it's more than just being able to speak German in rehearsals or being able to sing in German. You have to be able to get from point A to point B in a, it's in a country. And I couldn't even tell the taxi cab driver where I needed to go. So I studied my German for four hours a day when I was in Germany. And uh, so never experienced that again. Thank God. Yeah. And of course, in Germany, there's a rather different system than at the Met, the sort of repertory companies where yeah. you can be in a production and there will be five or six days with different performances b before you go on again, right? And not a huge long rehearsal period as well. And you might have some of the smaller roles be different every night, just because that's the way the German theater system works. Right. So yes, my Onegin was the same every night and my tenor Lensky was the same every night, but the Olga, who is the mezzo soprano, she might've changed every night and, and it was not a long rehearsal process and I was still very green. Yeah. And, but you learn. Yeah, Sink exactly. or swim. Yep. Yeah. Toughen up. And I did. Yeah. And it, some people might've quit after that, but it just, made me want to work harder because the greatest thing in our world is to be understood and to understand people. And when right. that is taken away from you, when you are not being understood and you can't understand someone, you feel crippled. And yes. I never wanted to feel that again. And I learned. This raises the question of audiences in different countries. So you have the chance to experience a New York audience, obviously an audience that experiences a very high caliber of opera and takes it more or less for granted, then Germany, eventually Paris and Vienna and Italy, London, and, and Japan. So what are the different audiences like? And, and have you ever experienced the famous clack system at, uh, at La Scala? Yes, I did. Tell us but about it wasn't, that. It was not aimed at me. So the clack system, it's really not in place anymore. But in the olden days, this would be a group of people who were up, up in the top ring of the Opera House at La Scala in Milan. And if you put the Metropolitan Opera is the most famous opera, La Scala is at the same level because opera really started there in Europe. And these people in the olden days were paid off by the singers to applaud them. Or if one singer wanted the other singer to not get as much applause, they would pay them to boo your colleague. And I kid you not, it is the worst feeling in the world getting booed when you are on stage. And they will boo for no particular reason because they don't like a, <clears throat> a blonde. They don't like your costume. They don't like where you stood. If you missed a note, I mean, it is a plethora of reasons why they will boo you. But I was doing a new production of the mass ball, Umballo and Mascara by Verdi. And uh, before I sing my big aria in the second act, Ecolori do Campo, which is supposed to be me looking for an herb a magical herb in a graveyard under the gallows. There was no gallows in this production. It was a, a set of bleachers with prostitutes who were doing drugs. Uh -huh. So right before I started singing at the end of the intro, because during the intro, there was a fight with the prostitutes and they were like doing the drugs and they were like, give me the drugs and fighting, blah, 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 blah. And somebody takes my fur coat and blah, blah. So right as I'm opening my mouth to sing, and they hated the production. <laughs> because it was sacrilege. This is not Verdi. And, and it was a, it was an Italian director actually doing this Damiano Michiletto. And so the conductor was all of about 28 years old and it was his debut at La Scala. Uh, heartbreaking. And the poor guy's looking up at me 
what do I do? What do I do? Shaking. And so I thought, okay, what would Maria Callas do? Most famous soprano in the world. And I thought she would tell them to shut up and stop. So I put my hands and I said, basta. And then I got applauded. <laughs> and I thought, okay, yeah, you know what? I just said, basta. Yeah. I want to sing. And I said, maestro. And we started. Good for you. You stared down the angry mob. and Exactly. And not all the booing that happens at, at uh, La Scala is paid. I mean, the, it, no. it has a kind of a sports-like element, like in a boxing match. If, if For example, if someone has a memory of a favorite singer and that particular approach to singing the role is the only one that rings true for them, and anyone else comes and sings at a different tempo, with a different phrasing, a different dramatic emphasis, you can Forget get booed. It. Well, the police were called at the end of that performance. Oh, really? Because it was like sport. They were like, yay, boo, yay, and they wouldn't let go of it. So we were not allowed to do curtain calls that night because they were afraid that there would be fist fights starting. And there was fist fights starting. They started fighting over, we liked the production. We hated it. We liked it. We liked it. <laughs> and so the police were called and everybody had to leave after the wow. opera was over. Yeah. So it is sport. You're right. It's, it's going to a soccer game, as we call it in North America, but football game here. Right. And yay. Yay, red team. No, boo, red team. Yay, red team. So. Uh, that must have been one of the few productions in which the cast members could have been placing bets on which side would win. I, I know. We were all standing there. <laughs> Actually, we were all in stage in shock going, what's going on? What? <laughs> because we couldn't see. The curtain was down. And, and we're all just going, we just sang really well. Yeah. It happened. But, yeah, and I had that happen here in Paris as well. A new production of... Uh, Verdi as well, Vepre Sicilienne. Mm. And we had a non-French director um, because it's about the Italians, the Sicilians and the yes. French and the war. Yeah. And at, at one point at the end of the opera, the, the French people had their little French flags and they were waving their French flags. <laughs> and then they were told to throw them on the ground and step on them in Paris, France. <laughs> Oh, where the opera made its debut, where the opera was premiered. And, and the, I think the whole audience, there was this just general, <gasps> and then boo, it was the <laughs> loudest boo I've ever heard. And the director was like, yeah, thank you. I love it. I take it. <laughs> and it's just, you sit there and you think, oh, you're on stage going, oh, that's sacrilege. You can't throw a flag on the ground and then step on it. But I can see it from the director's point of view is we don't want a complacent reaction. We right. want people to really get worked up over this. And of course, that's an opera in which there's a whole lot of killing, especially at the end. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's like Hamlet. What's the line where a ghost and a prince meet and everyone ends up mincemeat? Uh, yeah, it's true, isn't so, it? Yeah. Uh, that, I, I said to him, do I die in this? And, they, and the director said, darling. Everyone dies. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yes, exactly. Take a step back. Take me through the life of an opera production from a singer's perspective. From, And I'm talking, of course, about the pre-pandemic world. We're, we're going to talk about yeah. the pandemic world in yeah. a bit. But from the time you add a new role to your repertoire and what goes into deciding what you want to add to mm. receiving an engagement the whole rehearsal process, staging, costuming, until the time you step out on stage for the debut. What's that wow. all like? How much time do we have? You can yeah. you give the Reader's Digest version, but I, I don't think that a lot of people, even really passionate opera lovers, know what that process is like from a lived perspective. Let me start out with this, in that I'm going to tell you that I am booked out until 2027. Wow. So I know where I'm going to be until 2027. So let's work backwards with that. How did that happen? Uh, 
I say to singers, it's very important that you surround yourself with people whom you trust and just a handful. And in fact, for me, it's probably about that many, three people who I take their advice literally like gold. And so you decide as you mature, the voice changes and you decide there's a natural progression of roles, especially let's just say with the Verdi repertoire that I sing. One will sing Violetta in La Traviata. And the natural progression after that is something like Il Trovatore and to sing Leonora in Il Trovatore. After Leonora, then there's a natural, lightly, slightly heavier role than that you could say Ballo and Mascara or Aida. And the, it's a progression and you have to take those steps. So when I say, let's say the newest role that I'm adding to my repertoire right now is Macbeth, Lady Macbeth and Macbeth. And we say, I say to my manager, you know what? I think it's time for me to take on Lady Macbeth because I've done all the roles behind it. Forza del Destino, Ballo and Mascara, Aida, and I'm of a certain age. I'm gonna be 52 next month. So the voice naturally is maturing. So right, I wanna take this role on. So what do we do? He calls certain opera houses or knows of certain opera houses that are, that are going to be doing this. Or certain opera houses will reach out to my manager and say, hey, does Sandra do Macbeth? Has she thought about doing that role? Would she be interested in doing it? Have her look at the score. We say yes. Now this usually will be in two or three years from now, maybe even longer, depending upon my schedule and how things are going. So the opera house will then cast the rest of the role, uh, the roles, and they'll decide upon a director. They'll decide upon a conductor. And I'm very privileged right now and fortunate that they're usually new productions. So I have a little bit of a say and I get to talk to, to the production director and say, yeah, these are my thoughts about the role. Let's, let's talk about it. So then fast forward to two or three years from now, I've gone through, I've worked on the role slowly, and, but surely. And you start by listening to a recording of it. I, that's how I always start. And if there's a recording of Maria Callas, boom, that's the one I will be gravitated, I will gravitate towards because I really get her and I understand her vocal technique and what she does with her voice, with the text and the character. Listen to it and then I don't listen to it again. I listen to the orchestra to hear, ooh, that's a big moment. Gosh, I gotta be careful there. Then I start to break it down musically. And I take the score and I translate it, all of it, every bit of it. So I understand the story. Then I start working on the music very slowly. I just pound it out at the piano, just learn the notes. Then I start to what we call put it into my voice. How does it feel? How does this note technically, how do I work it? Then when I feel comfortable enough, I'll take it to my coach in New York or now via Zoom, because that's how we are working with people. Of course. And then fast forward to the first day of rehearsals. Now, first day of rehearsals, we have to be off book, completely memorized. Now that we're talking about a three hour opera, if not longer, if you're in Wagner, you're looking at six hours of music. And you have to be prepared with that. You have to know what you're saying. You have to know the notes and you have to be ready and able to sing it. Now, rehearsals can go on some days. You can rehearse for six or seven hours. So you also have to know how to conserve because it's one thing to be able to sing all day, but it's not humanly possible to sing six or seven hours full out every day. So you have to learn how to mark. You have to learn how to take it down an octave or sing it in this tiny little position, a marking position as well in the proper octave. And that really is great singers know how to get through a rehearsal process because you're looking at sometimes up to five or six weeks of rehearsal and it can be exhausting. Oh yeah. Emotionally exhausting, physically exhausting vocally exhausting and right. you have to build your stamina as a performer as a singer to be able to get through these long days you start with piano rehearsals and before yes, the you start with piano event. rehearsals and usually the first day of rehearsal we call it the first day of school because <laughs> that's what it feels like I mean, it's 
We grow up, but it's really the same thing. Wash, rinse, repeat. You're meeting all new people or, or people that I'm very fortunate. I get to sing with a lot of the same group of singers over and over again, but, and the director will give you his concept and he'll talk through the whole production. And then you usually have a musical and the conductor will work with you and see, okay, are you ready for this? Or do you have to actually go over with a coach? You might need a little more work there on that. And then you go through the process of learning this director's idea. Mm -hmm. Now, not every production is the same. Some are very traditional, but more often than not these days, for instance, the last new role that I did on stage was the very last role that I did before the pandemic. And that was Peak Dom in Russian, yes. in Chicago. And I kill myself by putting a plastic bag over my head at the end. Oh my so, God. Updated production. So you talk with the director and you say, I don't quite understand why she's supposed to jump into the river and kill herself, but <laughs> it's just, it's this discussion. It's a back and forth and you have to get, not only be an opera singer, but you have to be a psychiatrist in a way, because you have to understand what language they're speaking with this production and why they want it, because you have to inhabit that role. You have to become this person and you have to fully embrace their concept of the production. Right. And then you go into being on stage. This was all in a rehearsal room with mock-up, not the real set usually. Mm -hmm. And then you go on stage with the real set, still with piano. And then you slowly but surely add orchestra, you add chorus, and then you add costumes and makeup. And that's when the magic happens because that's when you transform, at least in my opinion, you become this person. It's not just Sandra playing a mm -hmm. character. It's when you become this person. And it's the magic of all of that. So it, it really is a very gradual building up process. Add another layer. Yeah. And then you have your debut and the run. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and then the next time you get booked for that role, it could be in a completely different production with Correct. different costumes different right. stage direction so you have to be in a different place a, a different yeah. physical relationship to the people you're singing with and to and so you have to unlearn some of the things that you toiled and sweated to to build up you have to strip a few layers away and then build them up all, all over again yeah and you have to have an open mind in this business mm -hmm. you really have to you and you have to know what is important to you as a singer, as an actress, as a musician, what are your parameters? For instance, I will not do nudity on stage. Mm -hmm. It's my personal choice. I don't feel comfortable with that. So I have parameters. And if I don't understand what the director or the conductor want from me, I will try it once, twice, three times. After the third time, if we can't mutually agree upon something, then something has to change. Mm -hmm. Because if I don't understand it, the audience is not then going to understand it because I am just the vessel. I am the vessel for the music and for the character. And if I can't convey that character vocally and acting wise to the audience, then we have to find another way to do that. And, and you have to believe it or else the people out in the house are not going to believe it. Absolutely. That, that brings us to your relationship with orchestras and conductors and mm -hmm. choir directors and costumers. I, I want to talk a little bit of particularly about conductors, but costumers, what's the heaviest, most unwieldy rig you've ever had to schlep around a stage? Without a doubt, Queen Elizabeth I, in Roberto Devereux at the Metropolitan Opera, the new production by David McVicker. Yeah, we I was started gonna, out. Yes, that's a monumental piece of kit. And we started out, they wanted it very traditional. So we started out with a metal cage for the hoop skirt. And the, the first dress, the white dress, had little, they looked like bullets. And wow. they were metal as well. Now that dress was over 60 pounds. Oh my God. God. And it had this 
neck piece as well. And every time I moved, it kept on hitting the back of my head. I would like, oh. And I said, okay, guys, I know that you want this to be traditional in the traditional costume in that whole period, but this is 2000, whatever. They have new materials. They have titanium, they have <laughs> aluminum. We don't need to use lead. <laughs> Let's work with me here, people. We got to shave off a good 10 pounds off of this because I can't sing. Now, sometimes it, it actually worked in my favor in a way because I found the character of Queen Elizabeth I in a way with that rigidity, but you can take 10 pounds off of it and still have that rigidity. Yeah. So, But 60 minus 10 is still 50, and <sighs> it's not a short opera, and it is an unbelievably vocally athletic opera especially for the lead that's you yes. and you have a lot of acting to do by the way anyone who hasn't seen this just see it it's, it's beyond a belief and i don't mean uh, the production is magnificent the opera is magnificent and uh, i want to get back to uh, into the the rediscovery and your re rediscovery of bel canto because correct me if i'm wrong but that is really almost a phase in your singing career after you'd already conquered the verdi heroines it, it, yeah it i went backwards of... i didn't go yeah, <laughs> most singers exactly. they start with bel canto and then go into verdi and, and puccini and, and i went the absolute opposite way because i like a challenge <laughs> Speaking of challenges, yeah. conductors, I and mean, they mm -hmm. presumably, uh, well, there are conductors who are primarily concert and orchestral conductors who will be doing Beethoven symphonies and Mahler and Brahms and Bruckner. And then they find themselves in an opera pit and they're working with people whose instruments are their bodies. They have to create the sound with their breathing. They have to change the sounds that come out and the speed with that physical mechanism to some of them. And every not, day is different. Yeah, exactly. Do some of them not get it? Does that happen sometimes that they, their mm -hmm. musical conception is preconceived and they have to bring themselves around to what a singer can accomplish? Yes. I've had a conductor once tell me, this is my Tosca. Oh, okay. I thought this was a collaboration. I thought, and once again, you have to be a psychiatrist in this business. Yes. What do you, how do you respond to that when they say to you the very first day, this is my Tosca and this is how I do Tosca. I'm Sandra. I'm different than Anna right. Trebko. Oh, another soprano, great, brilliant soprano, but She's different and we're living human, breathing human beings. So every day is different. And I had a conductor once pull out a metronome. Oh no. And said, Sandra, you're not, that's, see, it's written here. This is the tempo that I, that's, that he wanted. And I said, <laughs> yeah, okay, great. It's, that was just a guideline, by yes. the way. He yeah. just set it as a parameter. If you're a couple beats here or either side of it, I'm pretty sure that Verdi is not going to jump out of his grave and say, no, no, no. I, one thing about those composers is that they, I mean, in some cases, they conceived the roles for particular singers. They understood about singers. Otherwise they couldn't have written the music they did in the way they did. And as far as the standard is, here's a little story that one of the leading Rossini scholars in the world told me, which is I was talking about historical pitch because you know, today we sing at an A's 440 vibrations per second. And in the 19th century or the 18th century, you know, they now think it was A equals 415. So quite a bit slower, quite a bit lower. And yes. I said, was in Rossini's time, was it A for 415? And he said, no, the A was whichever town he happened to be playing in and what the orchestra was used to tuning. And it could go from... <laughs> A four sixty down to yep. A four oh six. And so no one can tell me that those composers weren't practical musicians who understood working with the conditions and the people 
that right. they had to collaborate with. Once again, there's that word collaborate. Yeah. You know, and, and in, in Vienna, Vienna nowadays, the Vienna Staatsoper is the highest tuned opera house in the world. And they tune well above 440. Wow. So, yeah. And, and you go there and it's, it's odd because I have relative pitch means that you basically know what you're singing and you know where it is in your mind. Like if somebody told you to sing an A, you could sing it. But when you tune it up or tune it down, it plays with your mind a little bit because yeah. you think you're either flat or sharp the whole time. Exactly. And yeah, it's, it's, once again, it's a conversation. I always call it a dance with a conductor. And I oftentimes say to a conductor, Hey, are you ready to dance tonight? Because <laughs> it's a give and take. If you were to dance strictly, there's no freedom in that. And especially in the Italian music that I do, there's a lot of give and take and give right. and take. And sometimes the conductor will give and sometimes I will give, but right. it's that conversation back and forth. And that for me is the best conductor and the best orchestras are the ones that listen to that conversation right. and they dance with you. And you really sense it when it's clicking and it's not a mystery why certain conductors are the world's leading opera conductors because you mm -hmm. sense that you can see them. They're singing the role with you they're breathing yeah, they breathe with you yes exactly yeah. and breathing with you is i would think critical because they have to understand that there's a column of air happening inside your body that has to sustain for the length of a breath in order to keep the phrase going and if they rush it too fast even if at a certain musical impulse they might like it they sometimes yeah. just have to compromise it and also you have to think about the difference between an instrument, a tangible instrument, like a violin or a cello or a piano. A piano is a percussion instrument, basically, because you're pounding on it, right? And the minute you take your hand off the key, the sound stops unless your foot is on the pedal. The human voice is completely different. We are a unique instrument in and of ourselves in that we need time to get the air in and get the air out. And the difference between an orchestral conductor and an operatic conductor, some people can do both, but I find that if you do one or the other, it's better because an, a stringed instrument or a, an orchestral instrument, it makes the same sound every day, give or take a little bit, but the human voice does not. And you have to be more flexible as an operatic conductor, because God forbid, I might be sick one day, or you might have family issues, or as a woman, you might have your monthly problem. And the voice changes from day to day. And conduct a good conductor, operatic conductor, understands that, listens to it, and adapts. Obviously, being the person that you are, you, it seems as though you've negotiated those negotiations very successfully because there's a string of amazing performances and conductors who keep wanting to collaborate with you. But what about directors? Now, directors, it's a whole different thing because back in the, the golden age, the age of what some people used to call park and bark, where the mm. singers would walk out on stage, plant their feet, never move, Basically, we used to have a joke in my record company that tenors would sing with their thumbs. Yes. This was their acting tool. We once uh, made a record with a tenor and he was being a little difficult and we threatened to take his thumb away and then he would be basically permanently without um, the ability to sing. And he, he didn't quite get that. But he was using his well, thumb a lot. There's a joke. I'm going to tell you a joke. What is this? Because a lot of singers, when they sing, they do this. Yes. You know, mm. but they also do this. So this is an upside down of that. You know, and it's <laughs> it's it's because so singers, they're always gesturing like this or like yeah, this yeah. or like that or like that. what does that mean? Nothing. Stand still. Yeah. You know? Exactly. 
but we're in a different era now. And yes. I would say in the past, opera was primarily a singer's art. For certain conductors like Toscanini, you could say it was a conductor's art because people would say, mm -hmm. I want to hear Toscanini's version of mm -hmm. Unbalo or Aida. But, and hear him singing along in the pit too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or screaming if you hear the rehearsals. Mm -hmm. But now the role of the director has taken on a hugely greater prominence. And you get what I would call the high concept reinterpretations where it could be, I don't know, Rigoletto in space or it's under happened. a bridge or I With mean, monkeys, you, monkeys yeah. mafia, every possible reconception. And I, I think experimenting is great. And I think that being imaginative is great. But sure. you wonder at a certain point, is it because they don't actually like the original material at all? And so that having been said, clearly this can put you in as an actress in some very unusual situations. Uh, from a staging point of view, postures that are difficult to sing in. And uh, how have you managed to navigate that different world? And I should say that some of your most successful collaborations, since you've mentioned them already, are with David McVictor, who to me finds this kind of sweet spot between being very imaginative and very creative, but also very respectful of the source material. Wow, that's a lot of questions. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. No, it's fine. Listen, as you say, as we've said all, all along, and I use this word a lot, it's collaboration. And as an art, think how far away we are from, say, when Aida was written. Yeah. It, it's hundreds of years ago, right? So we have to take that into account. And I think that there is something to be said about modernizing certain operas if they make sense. But if they do it for shock value, I'm not part of that. And there are certain directors nowadays who are known for the shock value and they do it just for the shock value. And I do think some days I do think that they just hate the art form and they should do something else. <laughs> yeah. Because I think that they are devaluing our art form and in a way mocking it and making fun of it. That said, you're right. For instance, here in Paris, I just did this production of Aida with a puppet, a human-sized puppet in front of me, uh, as well as Amon Azro, my father, had a human-sized puppet in front of him. Now that had a lot of challenges because at one point they wanted me to also control the right hand of the puppet oh. while singing a very difficult opera. And it's, it's negotiation, really. You have to yeah. say, you have to try it. And I think you have to keep an open mind because at some point in the last 10 or 20 years of our business, the power has shifted, in my opinion, from the conductor to the director. And I don't know when that transfer of power actually took place, but it has been definitely in my career lifetime. Mm -hmm. And it is sometimes counterintuitive because the opera house is oftentimes back then the director and not the conductor and the singers. And ultimately our art form is called opera. It's not called theater. Right. And there has to be a discussion. And when that discussion breaks and there's no communication between the music and the theatrical side, then you have problems. Because not only I, the performer, gets stuck in the middle because I want to do what the conductor wants musically, but also what the director wants. And then I become the person in the middle, the translator in a way. Yeah. And that's not my job. My job is to create, not that. So it's once again, going back to being a psychiatrist, you have to break down the situation and say, is this a battle that I can win? And I try it once, I try it twice, I try it three times. For instance, with the puppet hand here, I said, listen guys, I can't make my voice go out into the opera hall, 
standing behind a puppet that was about that tall up, yeah. up to me and manage a right hand while standing behind it. So let's find a way to make this work. Mm -hmm. And you have to stay calm. Yeah. And you have to sometimes remind them that what we do is not easy and that the ultimate goal is to make something believable, be it Planet of the Apes. If I believe in it, hopefully the audience will believe in it too. I'd like to believe that most of the directors who are moving in this more imaginative or more far from farther from the traditional direction ultimately want a a positive dramatic experience as well as a musical experience and are prepared to bend their will to the practical necessity of making the music work i i, I can give you an example from my experience which is Another one of our past jurors for the prize was Anthony Mengella. And Mengella was a wonderful, wonderful man, really absolutely spectacular. He actually died at the age of 53, two months after he was on our jury. And I felt like I'd lost a lifelong friend. But I had the chance to see his production of Madame a Butterfly after that, which right. coincidentally also uses puppets, v very smartly uses puppets in place of Butterfly and Pinkerton's Child, which is usually, a, it's a non-singing role, it's a non-speaking right. role, it's a role that that really, if anyone could ever find a good place for a puppet to take the place of a, a living human being, that's it. And it, it's a heartbreakingly beautiful production. But very creative, very imaginative. And I'm sure that his thought process was to take into account all the musical elements and respect them. And so I like to think that more of those directors will have relatively shorter careers when people realize that they don't care about anything beyond a rather narcissistic view of their own brilliance. Because ultimately what it takes is a dose of humility. No matter how great an artist you are, Giuseppe Verdi is greater, right? But let's think about it. Consumption. We don't have consumption anymore. It doesn't happen. So updating something like La Boheme or La Traviata, where the, the woman dies of consumption. Okay, yeah. Let's say she dies from cancer. I buy that. Yeah. I get it. Because we have to make it relatable to the audience. They have to put it in their own modern day terms. And I get that. But doing other things like a La Boheme in space or Planet of the Apes, Rigoletto, I don't yeah. necessarily understand that. That's true. Again, and it, uh, I think you have to look at them kind of case by case. For yeah. example, the Met had the Las Vegas Rigoletto. And I thought mm -hmm. that was a hoot and actually yeah. worked it, it really you yeah. know did have translatable dramatic elements from the original source that that didn't feel totally phony and artificial anyway uh, enough about directors they're wonderful people we love them a lot we the imagination is a wonderful thing but i i'd actually like to ask a i hope it's not an unsightly or an unseemly but a, a rather intimate question Sure. And that is about a part of your anatomy, your vocal cords. The vocal cords of a singer and an opera singer are, I think, among the miracles of nature. Because for people who have never seen a picture of human vocal cords, it's two little muscles that rest in the middle of your neck about where a man's Adam's apple mm -hmm is it's part of the voice box that includes the larynx it sits at the sort of midway through a column of air that starts in the lungs but the vocal cords themselves are in the case of a woman about the largest about three quarters of an inch mm -hmm. long there's mm -hmm. a pair of them and with that tiny pair of pieces of soft tissue you create a sound that can be heard by thousands of people over a hundred piece orchestra. Now, I think most people can picture it, but a trombone or a double bass, they're way bigger than a quarter of, uh, than three quarters of an inch. Yep. How do you 
do it? How is it physically possible? And I, I know that for opera people, this will be an obvious question, but for a lot of other people, it's not so obvious. Marilyn Horn, a very famous mezzo-soprano, said to me one day, Sandra, they're very fragile. They're just two little pieces of gristle. And you think, yeah, you're right. And we use them every day, all day. That's how we communicate. We use our voice and we know who that person is speaking right away because of the uniqueness of the human voice. Yeah. And so we have to think that, yes, they're very fragile, but they are still two muscles and they are muscles and you have to train them. And it sounds very silly for three quarter inch, these little things right here in our voice, you have to train like an athlete because these muscles have to be trained and worked out properly, healthily, and most importantly, not too much, but not too little. And you are the only person that knows what's too much or not enough. And I say the greatest gift to any young singer is understanding how your voice functions, how it works, how it doesn't work, when it works best, how it works best, what, what makes it unique, how it works like with the high notes, with the low notes, and figure that out. And yes, it's scary, especially when you get sick because so many elements factor into how these two little pieces of muscles vibrate together. And as a singer, you really need to know the anatomy of it and how exactly they vibrate. You need a picture of them. You need to see them because we can take a camera with a doctor and the doctor will go with a scope and look at your cords just to see how, because every, like every person, everybody's face is different. Everyone's vocal cords are different and you have to see how they work under pressure, how they work when you're sick. If they do work when you're sick, if they don't work when you're sick, what your voice does as a woman that time a month, there's so many things, allergies, what you eat affects how your voice, medications that you take affects your voice, your mood affects your voice, your hormones affect your voice, everything affects your voice. And you still have to learn how to get around it. Because if I were to count the number of perfect performances I've had in my career, one hand, performances that I say, it'll never get better than that. One hand. Mm -hmm. And I've been singing for 26 years. Yeah. It, you have to understand the anatomy and treat it like an athlete. The night before a show, you don't go out to a rock band concert. You don't go to a bar and smoke and drink and booze it up. You learn to take care of these little muscles in your throat because that is your livelihood. It's not only how you take care of yourself and also understanding your physiology, but it's also conditioning and technique, your breathing. Your uh, body is your instrument. This is my violin. This is my cello. This right. is my piano. And if I am not healthy on the inside, it's going to reflect on my voice on the outside. And of course, you're helped by composers who understand how to write the orchestral part in such a way that it can still be full, but the voice that is being written for can soar over or sometimes under and still be heard and still make art. Mm -hmm. So a lot of technique along with just, this is how I feel and I'm going to pour my expression out onto the paper. No, it's a lot more than that. No, it's, yeah. and it's all individual. Everyone has a different, everyone says a phrase or the words differently. And it's the exact same way with the singers. One singer right. will find this word more important or that word more important. And that's what's so magical about our art form is that it's unique. Absolutely. And it's all grounded in music and story. And speaking of stories, we have a, a little segment that we do every episode called Tell Me a Story. Now, I'm betting that with the world of opera all around you, you've had some pretty uh, remarkable and 
in some cases, strange experiences. Oh, just one. Two uh, or two. I told you the one about Marcial Sanguer. That was a very important and pivotal story in my career because, and I will expound upon that a bit more. I was at University of USC, Southern, Southern California, and I had just left. I had some issues there with a voice teacher and I found Marcial Sanguer through my best friend from USC. His father was his heart surgeon. Mm. Funny, you know, the, the, the connections that we make in our lives. And I had applied to Juilliard School of Music, had an audition, had a plane ticket, was ready to go. I knew exactly who I was going to study with if I got in, blah, blah, blah. And my friend's father said, I think you should sing for Marcial Singer. I said, who? He said, Marcial Singer. So this was well before the internet. I was like 18 years old. And uh, I said, okay, who's Marcial Singer? He said, he teaches at the Music Academy of the West in Santa Barbara. He's one of the best voice teachers, blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, I'll sing for him. And that's when he said, I have three things to say to you, Sandra. You are you have been given a gift. Number two, I have good news and bad news. I said, okay. He says, which do you want first? I said, I'll take the good news. You have no idea. No, he says, you will have a career. Good news. You're going to have a career and you're going to have a major career because your voice is very unique. Bad news. You have no idea how difficult this journey will be. So I said, because I had to call him Maestro Singer. It was not Marcial. It was Maestro because he was old fashioned. And I said, Maestro Singer can I study with you? And he said, hmm, because he wasn't taking new singers. And he said, for you, my dear, I will make an exception. Oh. And I went home, canceled my airplane ticket, canceled my hotel, canceled. I called up Juilliard and I said, I'm sorry, I'm canceling my audition. You're turning down an audition to sing at Juilliard. And I said, yes, I am because I have met the man that's going to change my career and my life. And so it was. And it was. That's great. And he said to me, he taught me so many things about singing. He taught me, if you're going to be a soprano, you have to be the best soprano there is out there in your fuck. And I said, how do you do that? And he said, work, work and more work. And he instilled all of these passion and wisdom into my head very early on in my career. And I am forever grateful to that man. Oh, fantastic. So I have three more things that I want to ask you okay. about. So the first, I can't leave without talking a little bit about Bel Canto and your emergence as, I would say, the preeminent Bel Canto singer of our time. And that, as you say, was chronologically backwards. Just for people who don't know, can you explain the difference between bel canto and verismo? Sure, absolutely. Verismo actually means, I'll call it passionate. Verita, it comes from the word verita. So it means truth, actually, verismo. And it means that operas are kind of written without pauses in it. So it, it's through composed, and it tells a story without stopping. Whereas other music like Verdi, you'll have an aria. And when the person sings the aria, it's like stopping time. And they're talking about the inner dialogue that's going on with them. But Verismo is very usually passionate music, kind of blood and guts, we call it. No, but Verita, the truth. And it's about the truth. So it's very heartfelt. Bel canto on the other side comes from beautiful singing. Bel canto, singing, beautiful singing. And it's a completely different style, technique. And some will say that bel canto is the basis for all singing in that if you understand this technique and this style of singing, you can then move on two different styles because bel canto was longer ago, historically, time-wise ago, than verismo 
operas were. So we're talking maybe a hundred different years. And bel canto really influenced the verismo style. It's a natural progression, just like pop music has changed over the years from the right. Beatles now to Britney Spears and all of that forward. I don't know why I chose those two, but off the top of my head. <laughs> right. So, so in, in this case, it's yeah. Bellini and Donizetti and Rossini. Rossini. Right. Yeah. As Bel all Canto. those Inis. Right. Yes, exactly. All those yeah. Inis going then into Puccini and Mascagni and all of these composers that did more the Verismo style, all influenced by the people behind them. But they took that and made it their own new style, like with paintings. We had the same, we saw that same kind of renaissance. So naturally, you stylistically, you normally start with the bel canto because it's usually a lighter technique. And then you go into the more heavier repertoire after bel canto, you normally move to things like Verdi, and then you move into things like Puccini. Right. Not me. I went the other way. <laughs> I started with Verdi and Puccini and then went backwards to Norma and to the bel canto style. But I think it's because I had vocal surgery in 2002 for an injury that I had as a child when I had pneumonia as a baby and they intimated mm. me and we think that's it. But I had this vocal surgery in 2002. Before that, I really didn't have the technique or wasn't capable of singing this bel canto difficult like walking on a tightrope kind of right. stylistic music. So I could sing the blood and guts because you just bleh, right. vomit in a way, the sound more, but to sing the bel canto, ooh, you have to have a good technique and you have to have clean vocal cords that work like a professional athlete. And I didn't right. have that. And because one of the features of bel canto singing is very athletic, coloratura runs, coloratura meaning mm -hmm. very quick transitions from one up to the next. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah like exactly. Somebody that talks very fast all the time. It, 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 yeah, <laughs> like <Right>. me. Uh, <laughs> and also a certain improv, uh, improvisational quality that the composers left room for the singers to add little flourishes and embellishments that they would invent themselves. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the rap in more recent years about bel canto singing is that it's not quite as dramatically powerful that it's a little bit art, yeah. more artificial it's a little bit more lightweight that it's vocal display for its own sake rather than in service of the drama you've turned that completely upside down and i particularly am thinking about the three tudor kings the queens not kings, queens. Not kings, of queens. Donizetti, yeah. Of Donizetti, yeah. Maria Stuarda, Mary, Queen of Scots, Anna Bolena, Anne Boleyn, and of course, Queen Elizabeth I in Roberto Devereux. Now, I think you were the first singer ever to sing all three roles at the Met. And yes. it is... Only. Ever, the, yes. E ever. Yeah. And first of all, unbelievably difficult from a performing point of view, just the music. Second, the dramatic power that you got, and I'm particularly thinking about Queen Elizabeth and the, the total destruction that she, in a sense, mm. brings upon herself through jealousy. <laughs> and it's, it's really remarkable what you've achieved and in a certain sense just as callus was able to do and beverly sills in her time i think it's really helped pave the way towards a really a, a new renaissance in this vocal art i'm glad i really am glad because it, it's beautiful music and especially you bring up roberto devera it, it's the most dramatic of the three because you are staring at a woman who we all knew, we all read about Queen Elizabeth I at the very end stages of her life. Yeah. So of course there's going to be despair, panic, it just all of these emotions and she's reflecting upon her life and what was it all about? 
did I have a choice in all of this? And I think it's great theater. I really do. And it's not just me. There has been a huge resurgence of the tutors, not just in opera, but in television, in theater, in film, because they're relatable. Yeah. That the royals, people, it's it's like the Tudor queens were the royals years and years ago. They were the all the scandal and, and right. all of that. And it happened. It wasn't made up. It truly happened. Yep. And but it, it with makes the power it all of the life more. and death. But with the power of life and death. Absolutely. And yeah. it, 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 to me, I found it fascinating just learning about these women and what they went through. All basically part of fame and money and power and what they had to give up all of them their lives yes in search of power fame royalty money greed some of them love and it's like olden days soap operas and it doesn't get any better than that yeah it's it really is amazing all right let's pivot because as you said, your schedule is booked for six years out, which meant that 2020 was supposed to be a year fully accounted for, according to a fixed schedule. <sighs> then this plague hit the world, and all the performing arts shut down, and the opera world still shut there, down. And it's still shut down. Uh, there we keep trying to open it up a little bit and then it doesn't quite work tell me just at a personal level how this has affected you oh every adjective you can think of i you have can, felt you it. can use them we don't censor yeah it has been gut-wrenchingly horrible for the arts for every art form because we are deemed unsanitary I you know, that to, to just to break it all down, what I do apparently spreads the coronavirus, even though there have been all of these reports out there now saying that the human voice does not, or that we can have an audience at least 50% in the opera house. But there are things, especially in North America, called lawyers <laughs> that if one person gets coronavirus, so it has been a roller coaster of emotions. It has been one, I, I got to the point where I wouldn't read emails from my manager or take phone calls from my manager because I knew it was gonna be bad news. And as a performer, we have to have something to look forward to, to keep us motivated, to keep us going that direction and not that direction. Job after another job got canceled. Panic started to, to set in. How am I going to pay my bills? Because my livelihood, I am the only income earner in my household. My husband travels with me. He does all the work for me. I sing, as I say, I just sing. So I see another job going and another job going. And after a while, it's 10 months of work that's gone. No income coming in. And I think, okay, so then you start thinking, do we have to sell the house? Because not many people have a year's worth of income set aside. Right. Not many people think, oh, there's going to be a pandemic someday. I'm going to save for it. Luckily, I have a husband who is very frugal and very smart, and he did save away for a rainy day. And I am one of the few fortunate people that had some small concerts. There are many artists, opera singers, musicians, instrumentalists, actors, keep going, dancers, yeah. all forms of art who still have not stepped on stage, made one cent since March 13th of 2020. And they are now having to go and reassess their lives and look at other professions, look at other jobs, temporary, permanently. Right. We don't know. And we have, I feel in a way that the arts have been brushed aside. And what do people look to when they are struggling emotionally, when they're down or when they're happy? What do they go to? 
music, the arts. We lift people up, we support them with what we do. And it's hard to do when you're depressed. It's been so discouraging. And as as tough as it's been for you, you are one of the best established people, but your situation reveals a a truth about the opera world, which is if you're a regular part of the company, like the orchestra member, and the company can still afford to meet its contract with you, you get paid. But if you are a singer who's brought in to be part of a production and the production doesn't happen, you get nothing. And I think this this pandemic has been an eye opener and a, and a, a springboard for an awakening in our business, my business, especially in the operatic business, in the operatic world. It has really shown a light upon what needed to change and how archaic our business was. And in some ways, it's a blessing. And I'm yeah. a very glass half full, not glass half empty kind of person. I always find the positives in a negative situation. And I feel that our art form was stuck way back there. We mm -hmm. were stuck years and years ago. And I think that now, hopefully, when things start to open up, that there will be some serious and much needed discussions happening. And not just with opera, but also with orchestral, yep. with symphonies, with theaters, with film business. I think that there have been too many inequalities. And I hope, I pray to God that the next year brings massive change. I agree completely. I there has been a lot of hierarchy and, and not all of this is because of you know some diabolical thing. It's just, we do things this way because it's the way it's been done in the past. And sometimes you need a traumatic wrench to force adaptation. But the other thing about opera is there is a huge repertoire of really wonderful operas that don't get performed because a production is very expensive. And for example, you sang Susanna in Carlisle Floyd's opera. That's a right. great opera. How often does it get performed? Because yeah. people don't know it. The tickets are very expensive. If they're not sure they'll like it, they won't come. The companies don't have the bandwidth to be able to afford to present it. And he composed many operas. He's one of the more prolific yes. 20th century opera composers. How many people know his work? It's gorgeous. And it is gorgeous. Know, and yeah. But I think the pandemic has now given us, and this is why I see hope and a light at the end of the tunnel, because I think this pandemic has given us another medium to communicate our art form. And that is what we're doing right now. Absolutely. And it is free. It yes. is a free art form and accessible to everyone. And it's not just, you don't have to travel to Toronto to see it or to New York or to Europe. You can watch it at the luxury of your home. And this has for me been one of the greatest changes in the operatic world because it's now more accessible and it's accessible to everyone. And you can do things like Susanna operas that maybe opera companies felt they couldn't invest in or wouldn't sell tickets or whatever the, the analytics were on what sells and what doesn't. But now we can do things like that and we can make it with young artists. We can, and there's so many more opportunities for so many more people now. Exactly. Cause I am hankering to have a chance to see Ballad of Baby Doe, uh, Douglas mm. Moore's opera. And, Beautiful. How often do you get a chance? It's so beautiful. Exactly. So we're going to wrap by talking about your particular adaptation into this brave new world. <laughs> I wanted to address one last word to the people who still aren't sure if opera is for them. First of all, it's clearly not snooty because Sandra, it's not exclusive. People actually don't worry about when to applaud because they applaud whenever they feel like it, as long as people have stopped singing. Um, yeah, listen so, to the person next to you. Yeah, exactly. It's not yeah. quite like the symphony. But the other part is just a, a little anecdote of my own because 
I had this experience, and I, I have to share it. We had a student intern, and he was a bit of a computer geeky type of guy. Very informal, a little socially maladroit, perhaps, but a good guy. And I took him for a visit to the bank to show him how we make deposits. And he's about 23, 24 years old. The teller was a very attractive young woman, and I could see that he had noticed her. So I decided to do a little thought experiment. I said to him, Jim, I can't remember if that was his name now, you want to know how to really impress a girlfriend if you want her to know that you're serious about the relationship and really get her attention? And he said, no. I said, here, voice of experience. And I said this loud enough for the teller to hear. You invite her for a date, and you tell her to dress up special. And you don't tell her where you're going. And you show up dressed really nicely, and you take her to a nice dinner, and then you take her to the opera. The what? And he, <laughs> no, he, he knew what opera was. Okay. okay. More or less, but he'd okay. never been obviously. And he basically started shaking his head and laughing and saying, no, come on, come on. I turned to the teller and she was going, yes, take me to the opera. Oh! I, I said, yeah, I said, and I turned to her and I said, do you agree with what I just said? She said, are you kidding? I would really know that he was invested in the relationship if he gave me an experience that special. So all of you who are listening, all right, in end of that story. You adapted in a really unique and marvelous way, along with your partner in air quotes crime, Carrie yes. Alkema, a fellow soprano, a wonderful yeah. soprano. You created the world's greatest opera podcast, Screaming Divas. Oh. Can you give us a Screaming Divas? Um, Screaming Divas. <laughs> yeah. Shenanigans. Yeah, Screaming exactly. Screaming Divas. Yeah, that's excellent. What I was excellent. There you go. So this is now in over 60 episodes and it's a real fixture throughout the opera world. It's been a lifeline for people in the opera, but you talk with the greatest performers and creators and company managers in the opera world and film kind of world. Yeah. Film world. Yeah. And it's like their talk therapy. Yeah. You had uh, William Friedkin on right recently. Yeah. Um, Kate Walsh, the actress. I We've had, we've really started expanding. We started with the core. Well, we started with Alexander Neef. Thank you very much for yes. the, from the Canadian Opera Company. We both said he had to be our very first person. And slowly but surely, we grew and expanded our reach as we were growing and expanding and learning because it is just Carrie and myself, two silly blonde sopranos who knew nothing about editing, about social media. We, it was trial by fire. We really learned, and it is still just Carrie and I doing all of this while having, you know, full-time jobs, singing or not singing, but yeah. And we love it. We have learned so much about ourselves. And I say that to young artists out there right now, find your creativity. If you can't sing right now, Find something else. Use a creative outlet. Find something that fills that void in your life right now that you're missing, not singing. It could be gardening even, but find something to channel that creativity into. And we did this YouTube channel, which now you can hear on Apple Podcasts. You can hear on all the podcasts. It just started as a video before, right. but now we've uploaded all of them so you can just listen to them as well, because a lot of people prefer that. And I understand that, but yeah. and, and it's, we have some great ones coming up. It's fantastic. And it's talk therapy for some of the people who have been left stranded, but it's also yeah. this incredible inside look at what the opera folks say when the stage lights come down. Like, yeah, love the, right. the one that you did recently with Carrie Lynn Wilson. I don't know whether you know this, but my old record company made her first record in South America. I did know that actually, because yeah. the one thing that this, a lot of things, we started it out, like you say, as therapy, because Carrie and I were talking on the phone 
way too much. And our husbands got to the point was like, come on guys, get a room. Really? <laughs> You're on the <laughs> phone all the time. But we said, but Carrie makes me laugh and Sandra makes me laugh. And then we said, ding, you know, that light bulb moment. If we're feeling all this, everyone else, so all of our other friends are feeling it. And we need to reach out to them and say, hey, it's okay. We're feeling it too. And let's talk about it. And let's have a gin and tonic over it while we're doing it. And just laugh. And we always feel better at the end of the interview. But the silver lining is we've learned so much about people that we really thought we knew. Bryn Turfel. I thought I knew Bryn really well. I've worked with him for years and years. Nope. Carrie Lynn Wilson. I've done concerts with her. Carrie did Tosca with her there in Toronto. We learned so much about our interviewees. And it's really opened my eyes when I do get to see all of these people and all of my friends and all these singers back in person again, I'm going to treat them differently. I'm going to look at my job differently. And I'm going to look at this business differently because we're human. Yeah. And we all have had the same experience over the last year. And I'm going to ask more questions. And I really love doing this. And well, it's, it, 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 it's really beautiful. It's sometimes hysterically funny. It's incredibly spontaneous. <laughs> and it is the ultimate behind the scenes. One day there'll, there'll be a book. There'll be a, there'll be a movie. We have insights. We have been given that privilege to, to be on the other side of the footlights, I say. And you know what? I think it's time that that veil was lifted over the secrecy of the, the operatic world. And you need to know, the public needs to know that we put our pants on exactly the same way that you do, one leg at a time. And some days it's even difficult to get those two legs in, on the pants because I just want to wear my sweatpants. And right. So it's, it's an insight into that side of the opera business, not the hoity-toity side of it, but the human side of it. And right. there, it's extremely human what we do. Absolutely. And, and powerful and sometimes funny. And, and some operas are really funny, by the way, folks. So yeah. if you want to get the answer to the, the secret question, what time's the next one, you got to <laughs> check, <laughs> you got to check out screaming divas it's it's absolutely wonderful and very entertaining and uh, just in parting first of all you've been amazing a wonderful guest and you've really just in this short time not so short but not a short time broadened my appreciation for what you do and achieve as an artist i hope that that our listeners will try it there's lots of opera out on the internet on youtube but where can people tune in on their computers and hear you next. What's coming up? Right now I have, there are three things I think that you can listen that I've just recorded in the last two months. You can Napoli, in Napoli, Italy, I recorded a role debut, Il Pirata. You can go to the Naples Napoli Opera House to their website. And I just recorded a duet recital with Piotr Bacciala. Oh, for the beautiful. Metropolitan Opera. It's beautiful. Yeah, That's the it one was... in Spain? No, it's in Wuppertal, Germany. Oh, in Wuppertal. Okay. Yes. And that's that was one of those five performances that I said that magic happened in my lifetime. That was one of them. That, I think, is no longer on demand for the Metropolitan Opera, but I just have been told that it's going to be broadcast on PBS in October. Just. But Fantastic. I think you can find the whole concert on YouTube somewhere. And then also my Aida here from Paris is still available on Arte TV and with Jonas Kaufmann. It's an amazing cast. Jonas Kaufmann, oh. Ludovic Tessier. It, it's fabulous. So, you and, and then I'm you and be... Jonas, hubba hubba. I have to say, that's it's, what my wife pretty... said. That's what my hubba wife hubba. said. Yeah, but he yeah, makes yeah. out with the puppet, not me. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. And I'm um, going to be recording... Next, uh, in a few weeks, I'm going to be recording a Verdi Requiem in Malta as well, oh, and that will be that. available. All of this information is on my website, on Instagram, on Twitter, uh, Facebook, 
And Screaming Divas has its own website, www.screamingdivas.com, where you can listen to both the podcasts and the video as well. Free. Sandra, you've been absolutely magnificent, and I'm I'm proud to have you as a friend, as a boss. And for those of our listeners who just want to experience, and if you're still not sold, go on to YouTube, type Sandra Radvanovsky, Casta Diva, and Aww. prepare for a few minutes of absolute heavenly bliss. It's just beyond belief. It's so beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. Sandra, can't wait for the next and for you back on stage where you belong. Thank you. And thank you for what you're doing for the Glenn Gold Foundation, Brian. This is amazing. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure. All right. Take care and, and go get some dinner. It's dinner time. Yeah. Dinner time. All right. Take care. <laughs> thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Olivia, I feel like I should be singing this, but uh, there is uh, one of the great opera singers of our day. What did you think of uh, our chat with Sandra? She's fantastic. I love Sandra. Every time I talk to Sandra, it's a treat. Yeah, it's uh, the only thing that's uh, a bigger treat is hearing her perform live. I've had a chance to do it quite a few times now. And, uh, you know, everything I said in the intro is true. I mean, she makes me cry. She absolutely, you know, has this ability to create this sort of spine tingling drama. And uh, she really is a singing actress. She inhabits the roles. It's, uh, it's a, a real treat. So when COVID is done, um, really, I just hope our listeners will go and try opera, especially if they're trying it for the first time. You know, when you have a chance to uh, experience one of the, the, the real greats um, up close and live, it's, it's really special. Um, so anyway, there's a, a plug. But in the meantime, uh, experience Sandra uh, online. Uh, there's some great performances ahead. Or just uh, check her out on YouTube. There's lots and lots of material. And she is one of the greats. She is. So anyway, I uh, just wanted to thank you all for joining us again. We'll have more great shows coming up in the weeks ahead. But in the meantime, Olivia, you have uh, a few things that you'd like people to know about? Yes, of course. If you enjoyed this episode of The Gold Standard, please make sure to subscribe. And if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, we would also very much appreciate your reviews and your ratings. Helps us out quite a bit. Uh, of course, you can follow us across all of our social media accounts just by searching the Glenn Gould Foundation. And of course, as you know, I'm sure we are a registered Canadian charity. And if you would like to make a gift to us to support our programming, you can do so on www.glengould.ca. Brava. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> In fact, it's, it's true. I could not have said it better or as well. So thank you again. We're getting we, good at we, this. Hey? <laughs> we're in a groove. We're in a groove. We have, uh, as, as Sandra would say, we have discovered our Fach. Um, anyway, uh, I hear a noise approaching a sound of music from days long, uh, long gone. Who could it be? Mr. Edison, please take it away. 